Good evening, people. We'd like to welcome you to Divine Truth Christian Center, where God wants your dreams and visions realized. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We honor you and we bless your holy name. For there is none like you, nor will there ever be. We thank you, Lord God, for your kindness, your mercy, and your grace. And we ask you, Lord God, to bring clarity and understanding to tonight's teaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm back after a one-day break. Um, I am um, so thankful to God for um, Elder Winsley um, standing in my place on last weekend um, in regards to um, speaking and articulating the word for the people. And so I'm back on the saddle as of today, and I just hope and pray um, that the Lord will um, allow for you to be able to really understand the words that we actually have going forward. So um, without further ado, one of the things that I definitely um, wanted to do um, Yep, we're just trying to get some little technical difficulties so they won't see all of the background on one thing, but because <clears throat> it's on two different layers, that's the reason why it's, you see the back. So one of the things that uh, we wanted to do as far as tonight is continue our series all about Jesus. Um, one of the things that we want to do as we definitely go forward is try to address some of the uh, questions about the Messiah. And so the f couple of things that... Um, that we will be talking about this evening is number one, um, the second temple, um, and it's time that it was destroyed, and that was during the uh, time of 70 AD. We'll also be discussing the atonement for sin that had to be made um, before that particular time, and also God had to personally visit the second temple before it was destroyed, and of course, Daniel's chronology. And so those particular items that you see right there are areas that um, we have set up so that um, or have our areas in regards to the scriptures that we actually need to uh, that we actually needed to speak about um, so that we can actually go forward. All right. OK. All right. Kids, please be quiet while you're out in the hallway and sit down, please. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. OK. All right. So one of the things that we want to basically articulate, number one, is um, who else but Jesus appears on the scene of human history to fulfill all of the things that basically scripture is actually talking about. And so one of the things that I definitely wanted to do, at, even as we go forward in the teaching, is just basically understanding, hey, um, that when we talk about the Messiah, we're not just talking about any arbitrary teacher. We're actually talking about an individual that fulfilled um, all of the scriptures that actually pertain to him. OK. All right. So I'm just going to give you like one little hold period and then we'll go from that point. Excuse me. Okay, just doing some little technical things. Hopefully I won't have to do that no more. All right, so I apologize just for the particular delay. But once again, if you can actually see it on your screen, can you put it on your screen, please? All right, so we have these couple of areas. Sorry about the confusion a little bit earlier. We had some technical difficulties. So these were the outstanding questions in regards to prophecy. Number one, the second temple was destroyed in AD 70 or 70 AD. Now let's freeze right there and just give a quick little synopsis of what that actually means. OK. In Matthew chapter 24 and 25, um, and I believe um, in, that, in those verses of scripture, um, there, it's called the Olivet Discourse. Olivet Discourse. Just like you have an olive tree, there's this thing that's called the Olivet Discourse. And in that Olivet Discourse, it was Jesus and his disciples basically going through a dialogue or a teaching session about a couple of things that were going on. Jesus was talking about wars and rumors of wars and um, earthquakes in diverse places. That was part of the stanza, but the rest of it began to talk about different periods in time. Some of them were immediate, 
some of them were about the past and then some of them were in the future now sometimes when we look at Matthew chapter 24 it talks about earthquakes in diverse places and things of that nature uh, part of that is talking about our time well into the future but when it was talking about the destruction of the temple some people were thinking that okay well you know the temple is going to be destroyed during sometime in the future or in some of the destruction or the destructive elements talk about the time of desolation or um, was talking about during some future time even beyond our time here 2,000 years later but it was actually talking about 70 AD in 70 AD the Roman Emperor basically raised Jerusalem to nothing it was basically destroyed down to nothing and so when it was talked about um, it should be um, abomination of desolation um, it was just a very very tough time they used to profane the temple they bought all different types of non-kosher um, elements inside of that particular temple and they desecrated the place and then they destroyed it and so that was the second time the temple was destroyed the first time was in the Old Testament um, um, and that's the reason why when people ask about certain books that like for example in the Bible we know that there's 66 books inside of the Canaan but there's other books that are referred to outside of the Canaan that we no longer have at our disposal like the book of Dat Jasher or the book of war the book of you know different types of books that are out there that are mentioned in Jude and some of the other things inside of the Old Testament um, that are no longer in existence because they were destroyed during the first uh, temple destroyed during the first temple Ezra the rubbish um, they were amazed that they were able to have the scriptures being preserved after all of they went through through the f destruction of the first temple but this one was the destruction of the um, second temple which was talking about in the future now that particular um, destruction of the second temple happened in 70 AD this was after Jesus um, has gone on to glory now some people will say okay well I thought Jesus was just talking about himself he says well, if you destroy this temple it will be raised up again in three days that is a physical temple as it relates to the body but not about this temple right here so this had to happen because it was a part of scripture okay and during this time period or 70 AD there was a lot of things and a lot of um, um, confusion going on in the body of Christ but it was still growing um, at a rapid rate and so 40 or so years after Jesus went on to glory a lot of the apostles um, were still um, at work some of them were in their latter years um, some of them have been martyred and bruised but the main point of that is is that you now have that back back background that Jesus actually predicted that event 40 years or 40 almost 40 to 42 years prior to him leaving this earth that's number one number two atonement for sin had to be made before then whenever somebody tries to say a particular president a particular dignitary is the Antichrist and the end of the world as we know it <laughs> is going to end like tomorrow they have a very um, uh, elementary understanding of scripture as it relates to eschatology eschatology is the study of the end times repeating eschatology is the study of the end times we cannot force God to come back faster than he is the reason why is because we have no control over eschatological events. We can't predict the future. We only know that God said through his son Jesus Christ that they will happen. So the only thing that we could do is watch and wait for those signs to actually happen if we happen to be alive during that time or just trust God that even if we pass on the glory before any of those signs come to pass that they will come to pass before we open up our eyes again. Prophecy has to be fulfilled. That's number two. Number three. I was asked a unique question by my uh, son as it relates to um, how in the world is it that, you know, we're talking about a time of Easter, Resurrection Sunday, which is actually fastly approaching us. This is actually the week of Pesach or Passover week. Jesus is our Passover lamb. And I love this second point, which is the atonement for our sins, because this is a great pivot point to 
remove one particular discrepancy, which is how is it that Jesus rose again after three days and when you count from Friday to Sunday, it's only two days. Friday, okay, then you got Saturday, Sunday. So how do you come up with three days? Well, number one, we first need to understand the event in and of itself. The reason why Jesus atoned for our sins is because we could not have a relationship with God um, outside of religion unless he did so. Okay. In the Old Testament, they sacrificed bulls, goats, and rams, and all of those other different types of things in order to show their reverence for God one-on-one. -on -one. But the truth of the matter is, is that it was Jesus who had to sacrifice himself for our sins so that um, we could be atoned from them and we ha are now justified by the righteousness of his blood. So that's the primary aspect of that. Another thing is, is that because there are so many attacks on this particular week, um, um, in regards to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, sometimes you have to bring clarity even to just minute things. So I wanted to remove one stumbling block, and that is the three-day aspect. Because you, you look at, once again, if he died on Friday, from what they say, then how in the world do you get three days from Friday? Because if he died, was buried on, it just doesn't add up, does it? Okay. But here's one thing that everybody needs to understand. Number one, the American Gregorian, uh, formerly known as the Julian calendar, is based off a solar type calendar. Okay, whereas in the Old Testament and the Hebrew who Hebraic calendar is a lunar calendar. Here we emphasize the day and the evening, or the day and the evening is a day. But in the scriptures, the evening and the morning is a day. All right, so I'm going to draw a couple of boxes. One, two, three, four. If you can't see this, uh, cameraman will adjust it so that you can see it. Okay. So what we have right here is Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Okay. Now that looks like it is three days. Okay. So if Jesus died, died, was buried, rose again the third day, so Friday to Saturday to Sunday is three days. But some people are like, it can only be two days. How can it be two days? All right. Well, first of all, from a scriptural standpoint, we need to understand that in the book of Genesis, it said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was out form and void and darkness was on the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light or let there be power throughout this it particular atmosphere so I ask you when you look at Genesis how do they start off with the days and it says and the evening and the morning was the first day okay now I get that it seems like it makes sense but one of the things that hit me as somebody was talking about it is um, first of all it actually is very accurate because before the Sun existed existed there was darkness everywhere so it couldn't have been daylight that started off first and then go to the evening right it had to be night first and then daytime because God said let there be light and then he created the stars the moon the skies the greater light which is the sun and then the lesser light so when he said let there be light it doesn't mean let there be sun the sun isn't light the sun gives off light you got that the sun isn't light the sun gives off light. So in Hebrew culture and in Jewish history, they don't start days at midnight like how we do. The new day, for example, Friday will start at midnight tomorrow, correct? Technically it will. But it's not like that everywhere around the planet. If you go, it's, it's becoming to become evening time right now, but whereas on another part of the world, it's actually early morning. So on the Western Hemisphere, which is where we are, darkness is, is getting ready to come upon us. Whereas on the other side, opposite side of the planet, it's like three or four o'clock in the morning. And it's going to be sometime by the time we get to midnight. You understand that? It is very important to not put everything in a... Um, Western type of context. Very important for us to understand that. Okay. So 
when we're talking about the three days, when we're talking about advancement of um, the days in regards to just kind of getting rid of that particular mystery, we, all, we always have to understand that the evening comes first. So if you look at this diagram that I have on this board right here, instead of American time, we look at everything linearly. Like that clock up there, you see the 12 up at the top? 24 hours, so if it goes from that, so if that hour hand goes all the way around one time, we call that a day, right? Mm -hmm. But whereas in the Middle East, it's lunar time. So it starts off a little bit different. So when you look at scripture, around six or seven o'clock is when the, when the day actually starts in the Middle East. So from Thursday to Friday, from evening, that's M, to morning, that's one day. Everybody got that? That's one. Second thing, from the evening to the morning, that's two. From the evening to the morning, that's three. So for, so once again, just to explain what this is, once again, some people was like, but Jesus didn't rise up in three days, because how can you get three days from, from Friday to Sat Sunday? Well, if you did it an American way of telling time, then it doesn't add up. Because Friday, one, two, uh-oh. And early Sunday morning. Well, Pastor, I don't know if that's really true, because how can you get three days from Friday to Sunday? How? If we counted our way, one, two, one, two, that's American way of doing it. But the Bible, watch this, is not an American book. It was not constructed in America. So we always have to understand that the lunar calendar is what driven or what drives the scriptures and the uh, Bible in regards to that. So the evening and the morning were the first day. You got that? Amen. The evening and the morning, second day. The evening and the morning, or excuse me, evening, excuse me, evening and the morning, first day. Evening, morning, second day. Evening and the morning, third day. So the Middle East actually is in between the American way. Everybody kind of following me? You got to get me? Okay. Once again, the reason why that is important is because you have a lot of people that say that Jesus didn't rise up in three days, and it's a lie. Get off of work. Normally, what you say is the day is already done, isn't it? The day is already done. You get off at five o'clock or six o'clock, and you're finished with everything, and then your evening gets started, and then you start preparing for the next day, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, he said, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't get it. But... The truth is, is that typically we say the day is over because most activities start, stop after you get off of work. You go out and party, but as far as work, no. So just like we say that the day is over and our eight hour period is over with and we don't just start out all, all over again under normal circumstances in the Middle East, they do it in a different way. All right. So I just wanted to touch on that as, um, just as a little bit. So that's how you have to look at it. That's how you get the three days. Um, and it's based on scripture. Remember, once again, in Genesis, the evening and the morning were the first day. They didn't say the morning and the evening were the first day. You see what I'm saying? They said the evening and the morning because darkness was here first. Then light came because God spoke it into existence. Mm -hmm. If it was the opposite way, the day and the night were the first day, then that means that if God said, let there be light, it would be a contradiction. And that means that light would have been here all the time. So why would you say let there be light if light was already here? Just something for you to think about. All right. So that's number two. Number three, God had to personally visit the second temple before it was destroyed. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, he went to the temple and he began the teaching in their synagogues. Okay. One of the things that he said, which is one of my favorite scripture, is that, um, I have come basically to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, um, to heal those that are bruised. And, um, and he was reading those out of a scroll in front of all of the Jewish Pharisees. And they were just astonished and basically saying, I am what this scripture is actually talking about. 
So that was fulfilled. And then, of course, Daniel's chronology. Now, Daniel, the book of Daniel is one of the most difficult books to understand in regards to prophecy. I don't believe that we're ready just yet to kind of get into the math of that. But if you do want to go to calculus, go to the book of Daniel and you'll see how during his dream and his vision, he uh, predicted a lot of the things that's going on in our days and times as well as in the future. Okay, that's just something that you want to put in your pocket for later. So the primary thought of today is who else but Jesus appears on the scene of human history fulfill all of this. That's basically the thing. Who else do you know predicted that the second temple was going to be destroyed, had the ability to atone for all of mankind's sin, fulfilled the um, prophecy that um, God would personally visit the temple while he was on the planet in the person of Jesus Christ, or to fulfill the prophecies that was uttered inside of Daniel. Nothing but Jesus. So the question is, as we go to the next piece, is Jesus God? Now this is the, this is the kicker right here. This is what separates um, some sects of Christendom apart from the other. When I say Christendom, I'm talking about everybody who says that they are a, um, that they know who Jesus Christ is. But I have to give a delineation. Mormons know who Jesus is. But they do not accept Jesus as God. That's number one. But they're part of Christendom. Catholics know who Jesus is. And they accept him. But they do not believe in sola scriptura. Which means sola scriptura is basically Latin for scripture alone. They believe that. This Bible is true and some other books that the saints wrote is also just as valid as the scriptures themselves. Meaning in the Reformed tradition, we have 66 books of the Bible, but in the Catholic tradition, it's 73. They have the Apocrypha inside of them, the book of Tobit, the book of um, Jude, I mean not Jude, um, the book of uh, there's some other books out there. The Book of Tobit, the Book of Thomas, Maccabees, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees. Those are also in there. Now, there are some truth in the Apocrypha. Apocrypha means, it means secret or hidden. But there's some truth in there. But the reason why it was taken out of the canon is because a lot of the scriptures that you read inside of those books deny the um, deity of Jesus Christ. They just treated Jesus as a regular man like Muhammad. Or a regular person. When you strip the deity from out of Jesus Christ. Just think about it. If you strip the divinity from out of Jesus Christ. We're still yet in our sins. That means he just died for just for nothing. He was just a radical hippie. You know we like to say hippie. Because the pictures say that he had long hair. But we don't know if he had long hair. Matter of fact we are nine times out of ten. Sure that he did not have long hair. Because in Jewish customs or tradition. A woman's hair was seen as her glory. But for men the beard was his glory. So if you had a long beard, then you fit within society for a man back then. But long hair, that was actually a disgrace for a man to have. But grandmama got that. Oh, I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> so you have to understand history. Okay. So let's look at this. Let's, let's, let's look at this. O followers of the book, do not exceed the limits of your religion and do not speak lies against Allah. Oh, okay, that's not in the Bible, but I got to read it anyway. But speak the truth. The Messiah, Isa, son of Miriam, we know who this is. That's Jesus. Son of Miriam, Mary, okay, is only an apostle of Allah. Stop right there. Now, this thinking, now, number one, Islam came about 1,500 years afterwards, okay? But this thinking is actually the thinking of the Jews, too. It was thinking of a lot of people in the Middle East because Jesus said, who do, you, who do men say that I am? Some say that I'm Elijah. Some say that I'm a prophet. Some say, oh, excuse me. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're a prophet. Some say that you're a good guy. But Jesus, when he was talking to Peter, who do you say that I am? You are Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said back to him, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. It was the spirit that let you know that. So this particular understanding 
is dominant across a lot of individuals across the Middle East who do not accept Jesus as God. So repeating, the truth, the Messiah, son, Isa, son of Miriam, is only an apostle of Allah. Allah means God, but not our God. Allah is not equivalent to Jehovah. That's number two. And his word, which he communicated to Miriam and a spirit from him. Believe, therefore, in Allah and his apostles and say not. Three, desist. It is better for you. Allah is only one God. Sometimes they say, God, oh, we believe in one God and God has no partner. Far be it from his glory that he should have a son. Whatever is in heavens and whatever is in the earth is his. And Allah is sufficient for a protector. And this is out of the Quran. So Jesus certainly never believed himself to be God. That was his logic. That was this individual's logic. So when you see a Muslim, a Muslim, when they hear about Jesus, they just, or when they see Christians and Jews, they call these individuals followers of the book. So they do like the Bible, but they don't believe everything in the Bible. When you hear the nation of Islam and you hear Farrakhan, it sounds confusing sometimes because Farrakhan sometimes preaches out of the Bible. Okay. But he does not believe Jesus is God. Not, in, not as far as deity is concerned. He could say the black man is God. But I don't have the power to raise myself up again. I, have, I don't have any power to sometimes get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> I have to let my juices flow in the right place and I got to sit on the edge like when I was young like man age I could just pop up boing hey y'all it's a new day but now I just got to sit there for a little while and then I got to sit up make sure I don't fall on the floor from getting up too fast from out of dizziness then I got to put my feet down then I got to make sure that make sure it stops tingling and then I stand up and then I move forward okay <laughs> all right so let's move to the second piece Prophecies of Messiah being God. So here's, here's some scripture. Let's start off with math, oh, excuse me, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says, But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the class of, clans of Judah. For you, one will go forth, from you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from a long, are from long, are from long ago, from the days of eternity. It means O Lamb in the Hebrew. This is from Micah chapter five, verse two. Now, what do we know about Micah? Micah was the last book of the Old Testament before Matthew came on the scene. The scholars say that it was about four hundred years in between that time. Now, you would think that. It, you have to be insane to try to fulfill a prophecy that's 400 years old without being called a madman. Just one. But so many? That's astounding. But it was talking about him. Here's another side note. For all of you that may have Jewish um, colleagues at work or you may know somebody who's Jewish and they don't accept ex um, 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 except Jesus, you would figure that if they read the book, they would see that Jesus is the Messiah. A lot of reasons why they may not necessarily want to hear what a Christian says is because a lot of them grew up with um, people that had crosses in their hand cutting up family members during the Holocaust. So their reception of the scriptures and the Bible is tainted because they have a negative view of Christians from that era and from that time. But once you get past that and you go and you do get a chance to befriend them and you go through the scriptures, then you're going to um, get, begin to see them begin to turn. But that's with anyone, right? It's with anyone. Just just a little side note. Let's look at Psalms 90 verse two. Before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Look at that. So it's saying that Jesus is God from the very beginning. The first scripture says that. Who else fulfills that description? It's not David. It's not Moses. It's not Paul. It's not Silas. It's none of them. So Jesus is God. There's three that bear record in heaven. And Jesus is God. Let's look at the last one. Joseph also went up to Bethlehem while they were there. The days were completed for her to give birth. So what this is doing right now is it's showing the 
old then it comes then you also see the old part in Psalm this is David talking here and then you look at Luke so what you see right here with this first set of scripture is the fulfillment down here the prophet Micah spoke about it in 700 BC several hundred years later then you have it being fulfilled through Joseph and Mary okay let's keep on going Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 this also was around 600 to 700 BC therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign behold a virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel there you go all right look at the years okay that's a long time now look at this one everybody knows this one this is one that's going to be a part of the Christmas speeches Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 for a child will be born to us a son will be given to us and the government will be rest upon the shoulders and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty God eternal father prince of peace okay 607 years before Christ entered and then whoop there it is Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit so the main reason why um, and for those of you that are watching online, why we go over things like this is once again to know what you believe and why so that when you do get up on Sunday morning and you shout, you can shout with full knowledge and understanding of what you're shouting about. It's difficult to shout in ignorance. You can shout in ignorance, but after a while, you're going to be like, okay, this preacher is hollering a whole awful lot, but... I want to understand and I don't want to yell. You can yell at a football game, but yelling at a football game, you at least understand what a touchdown is, right? Now, just imagine if they said, come on, get on your feet, and the man kept on throwing interceptions over and over and over again. You're not going to be like, yeah, a great interception. Not if you're on the team that's trying to score. So you can't shout out of ignorance. You have to shout out of understanding the scriptures, at least at a basic level, so that when somebody asks you, why are you so happy about Jesus Christ? Well, this is why. This is why. He saved me, and this is also what happened as a result of him saving me. I wanted to know more about him. I can't live without, I, I know too much about him. I can't live without, that is why I love him, so he's so real to me. When you know more about him, you love him more. Okay. Because you can't trust who you don't know. Y'all look at me. If you never met me before, you'd be like, okay, I don't know if he's really real. But then after you get to know me for a while, you'd be like, okay, I can trust what he's saying because it's been consistent. All right. Now, I'm going to kind of move on. I'm not going to get into Napoleon or anything like that. Because, but he just made a reference to Jesus. So let me just stop right here and pause right here for a second because a lot of people once again Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus is God <laughs> let us tell you about Jesus and it, and it sounds so nice they ride around on the bicycles with white shirts and black ties with helmets on that's about this big and they knock on the door and they said, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the scriptures. Let me tell you what God's plan is for the rest of the um, age. And it sounds normal. Until you read the doctrine. Until you understand about what the watchtower is. Until you begin to understand that they do not affirm that Jesus Christ is um, God. Until you find out that the founder of the... <laughs> until you find out that the founder is um, recent. You look at Mormonism, Mormonism is recent. Joseph C. Smith, prophets in America, once ran for president. Brigham Young University, it's all surrounded around that. Okay. 
Now, the average person doesn't have to know all of that. Grandma and them, they could care less about all of those little details. They just said, baby, just believe. And you, they prayed, and they prayed fire down from heaven, and that was good. But we are in a different era now because we got so many young people that are into uh, Egyptian mysticism. They're into um, um, uh, all different types of belief systems, atheism from a Western standpoint. Um, Gnosticism, a lot of spiritual weird stuff. We got a, got a taste of that tonight with the visitors, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you see somebody come inside of the church with a little dog in their arm talking about something, I got a little prof prophecy for you. Look out. All right. Now, God can do anything, but he does things in decency and in order. So did Jesus compare himself to God? Number one, God in the Old Testament, he said, I am. Jesus compared him to himself. He also said, I am in John chapter 8, um, 58 and 818. Also in the book of Revelation. So let's look at the first one. In the book of Exodus, Moses was wondering, who is this calling from out of the burning bush? Who is this thing? It was a theophany. It was fire, but the bush was not burning. Who does that? Now, if God revealed himself, we wouldn't even know what he looked like. Number one, it would kill us. Because no man has ever seen God and nobody can see God because they are sinners. And that's everybody. The only person who can stand before God flat footed face to face is himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So God described who he was in the beginning by saying, I am. Now, when people say, well, is, isn't God's name supposed to be um, important to know? Nobody knows who God's name is. Nobody does. Because God never said what his name is. He said, I am. Now, is I am a name? No. It's basically saying, I exist. I'm beyond a name. Because name denotes ownership and nobody owns God. The names Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sittenkanu, Jehovah Rapha, all of those, those are characteristics of the I am. You can't draw a picture of him. He said, I don't want you to draw no pictures of me. So all these pictures of Jesus all on the Internet and things like that. The scripture says specifically no graven images because you have no idea what I look like. You have no idea. And it's the and I understand the wisdom of that because you have a lot of people who have derma dermolatry. What do you mean by that? Derma means skin. And they make an idolization of the skin. That's why you have black Hebrew Israelites. That's why you had British Israelism. So we thought about the black Hebrew Israelites and they thought that they were the original Hebrews back in the 1800s or 1600s, somewhere around there. The Brits actually said, thought that they were the original Hebrews, too. So this happened before. It was called British Israelism and people got caught up in the skin. And because of your skin, now you begin to think that you have righteousness of God because of your skin tone and your bloodline. But I used to think, what is it about that? Well, some people do it because it helps them, you know, with their self-esteem. That's one part of it. They address racism or address um, um, or to exert superiority as far as other groups are concerned. That's one part of it. But, you know, the deeper part of it, the deeper part of it is if I can base my salvation on who I'm related to and what I'm looking like, character doesn't matter. Character doesn't matter. I could be a good for nothing backbiting whoremonger on my way to hell with gasoline draws on, sipping <laughs> Heineken liquor, drinking my Swisher, uh, you know, smoking Swisher sweets, uh, Viceroy's, Newports, and all that other stuff, and I'll still go to heaven because I am from the original bloodline. It doesn't matter. I'm a covenant. All I got to do is just keep a couple of laws, atone for sins based on what I think is the right type of sin and then I'm in but that's works based righteousness and that won't work and I'm so glad that we don't have to work in order to get on God's good side most of us disqualified ourselves from being on God's good side yesterday and this morning <laughs> whether in thought or indeed so no one can say that they are good no one could be arrogant enough to say okay well I got it all I got this Christian thing down pat with my thumb up oh no you can't no you can't 
in the Old Testament, you see the shepherd. In the New Testament, God calls himself the shepherd. Old Testament, the light. New Testament, the light. Old Testament, ruler of all. New Testament, ruler of all. Judge of nations, old and new. Bridegroom, old and new. God's word will never pass away, old and new. First and the last, old and new. We know about that. And first and the last in the book of Revelation. That actually ties in with I am because when Jesus was in his glorified body, okay, somebody so crazy the other day was just saying, well, that's a picture of Jesus. <laughs> he had hair like wool. And I was like, okay, hair like wool doesn't mean that it was wool. It was white like wool. Let's talk about a color. And when you see the description of Jesus inside of the book of Revelation, that was a human's best effort to try to discover, describe something they never seen before. Jesus never said that I will have eyes like fire and like wool. No. So it was an old man, John, about 90 years old, trying to just just be able to just describe exactly what he's seen based on what he has already seen. I'm looking at Jesus' glorified body and his hair is white like wool. His eyes are of fire. His feet are like burnished brass. Not dark brass like bronze from a penny. Burnished brass. You ever seen a, a knife come from out of a, a furnace? It's bright. It's on fire. That does not look like my skin. No, it doesn't. It doesn't look like anybody's skin. It's a heavenly image. And God said in the person of Jesus Christ, I am Alpha and Omega. Now, when you look at Alpha and Omega, from the get jump, you already know that those are Greek words. Alpha means beginning. Omega means end. Now, how can a human be beginning and end at the same time? Translation, he's saying that he's infinite. Nobody created me. Like the little kids say, well, who created God? No, there's this thing called infinite regress. If you keep on going backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards, and backwards you're going to get to God. Very important. So, yes, Jesus did compare himself to God. Jesus said, I counted not robbery to call myself to be equal to God. Wrapped up myself in flesh. In order to atone for a whole bunch of crazy folk that are out there who don't even want to have a relationship with me, but I died for them anyway. And I'll work with them. That's good news, especially when you get saved. When you get saved, you're not going to be or have it all together when you first get saved. That's a lifetime process. It takes the rest of your life to get on the good foot with God. You only get it right when you get to heaven. <laughs> and the way you get to heaven is not based on you, it's based on God's love for you through his son Jesus Christ and his blood. It helps you to relax but not relax too much. <laughs> That's what you call uncomfortable comfort. Because when you love God, you're not just going to do whatever the hand fat that you want to do. You're going to be like, oh, oh, here we go again. Lord God, I'm so sorry. Please help me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. I just screwed up. I messed up. Lord God, I, I know that I'm not right. Lord, help me with this. And then God works with you, works with you, and then you get tired of getting whoopings from God. And then you'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I cry uncle. I'm going to go ahead and eliminate that part of my, out of my life because I don't want to keep on experiencing pain or whoopings from God like that. And what I mean whoopings from God, I'm not talking about an aggressive, uh, torturous manner. I'm talking about him disciplining you by sometimes taking away or holding up certain blessings inside of your life or just being quiet. Sometimes it just doesn't say anything because you haven't passed the test yet. Uh -huh. And he gives us different types of tests. Sometimes he gives us a test through just not saying anything because you're in the midst of a test. Can you help me, Lord? Mm -mm. Here's your test. You said you want it greater. Here goes the greater test. See that? There's the greater test. It's going to, oh, oh, you need to repeat the class because you didn't study for greater, right? In this particular test, you're going to have to pray and worship and praise. You're going to have to go in deeper into Jesus Christ. You can't escape your way by this test. No, 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 not this time. Oh, it's going to take you 10 years to pass it, right? Oh, okay. Don't worry. I have all the time in the world. And then some people get pop quizzes. All right. Here goes a disease that's going to afflict your mama's body. She got cancer. You've been preaching like Paul and praying like Silas. And now 
the same thing that you've been encouraging everybody else with, here goes, sin has entered into your mama's body, and now you're going to have to continue to preach the goodness of the Lord despite that calamity. Test. Can you pass it? And he does that with different things all throughout our lives. That's the reason why it's so important for us to know who he is so that we could put this world in proper context. So did Jesus compare himself to God? We see this, the sower, the shepherd, the rock. We see this all over scripture. In 20 of Jesus' parables, he identifies himself as God. He is not a regular person. He is not Mahatma Gandhi. He is not Sung Young Moon, who's now gone on to glory. He's not those people. He's not Muhammad. He is God. Some statements made by Jesus as we come around the mountain. Truly, truly, I'm only going to do a couple of these. But these are what Jesus said about himself. Now, that's what you should pay attention to. Don't always look for what a human says about God. Look at what God says about himself. A human said Jehovah Jireh, but God never said I am Jehovah. He just said I am. You call me Jehovah, which is translated as God. That's just Hebrew for God. Elohim, God. But God never said his name because no name can contain him. So we just call him God. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, wait a minute. Oh, here we go again. I am. He said that to the Pharisees before Abraham was. I am. Now, what does that mean? It's kind of obvious, isn't it? Well, let's think about it. Abraham wasn't born yesterday as he was saying that statement. If he was born yesterday, Jesus could say, hey, well, I'm about 31, 32 years old. So before he even came on the planet, I was here. But that's not what he's talking about. Abraham was around maybe about a thousand or so years prior to that. So if Jesus is saying before Abraham was, I am, that must mean that he was there before Abraham. That means he's eternal. One example. Second example. Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that it, he, you will die in your sins. That's the reason why we just as Christians can't just arbitrarily just gloss over this weekend as if it's just another blip on the calendar and not have any knowledge of it. Did he die? Yes, he died. <laughs> Sunday morning. But why did he die? Why was he buried? Why did he rise again? What changed in the atmosphere? What changed in people's lives? Why is it that people died for this man? Multiple times. Why is it that somebody who is a good for nothing homemonger, backbiting, <laughs> on their way to hell, cussing Christians out, writing all different types of profanity, then they meet this man and their life totally changes? Who does that? Is it willpower? Is it because you watch Ileana Van Zant fix my life? Is it because of Oprah? No. You got another job? Oh, you changed because you got a job? No. As you can tell, even when we looked at our presidents, past, present, and future, so people won't think that I'm just being biased. Just because you have power doesn't mean that it makes you moral. Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. Now, some people try to explain that statement away and say, well, that's what he means, that spiritually, not literally. But all of these scriptures are just spiritual. I had one young lady tell me the other day, I'll come to your church if, if the way that you teach the Bible is all allegorical and all symbolic, but not literal. What she was getting at is that I don't really believe that anything in the Bible is true. Never mind Israel. Never mind all of the artifacts and all of the archaeological evidence and all of the Moabite stone and all of those things that are around there. Never mind it, all of that. I just, you know, I just, I, I, you know what the excuse is? I've been a Christian all of my life. I've been a Christian since eight years old and I decided that I've gotten woke. And once I woke up, I left the church, never to return. And I said, you were a hypocrite for all of those years. You never knew him. 
You wasted time. Your parents made you come and you were never saved the entire time. And now you're bitter and mad because your time was wasted. So now you rail at a faith that you really wanted to be a part of. But we think that because we've been inside of a building, therefore we shall be just become saved. Just because you walk through these doors doesn't mean you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Who does that? That's religion. That's I have to do something in order to get close to him. No, you get close to him because he's done something to you. It's not the other way around. That's what makes the Christian faith different from all of the other stuff that's out there. I don't have to pay, pray to Mecca, no disrespect. I don't have to pray to Mecca in a particular direction during a different time of day for seven times a day on a, with a, on a little rug, with my head bowed to a certain area with my head covered in order to get closer to God. I get closer to God because Jesus went before God on my behalf through the cross and through Calvary. That takes a lot of pressure off of us. And he would rather you love him versus because you want to because versus loving him because you have to. I want to love my wife because I have a great relationship with her, not because I'm fearful of divorce. You see the motivation? One of them is toxic. The other one is genuine. These are just some other statements. I'll just read the last one. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And then I'll conclude with this one. And I guess we have another part series to this and then we'll finish this up for next week. And it says this, this is by C.S. Lewis. This is the uh, Lion, Witch and the Roar Drove, C.S. Lewis. Okay. Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis. Great theologian, C.S. Lewis. Look at what he says. He says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Now, pause right there. That's what a lot of people think. They believe that Jesus, once again, was a hippie that just did community service. But he does more than that. Even gangsters do community service. Repeating, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That one thing we must not say as Christians and as believers. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic or he would either be a lunatic on the level of with the man who says he is a poached egg <laughs> or else he would be a devil be the devil of hell you must make your choice either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse just think about that you can shut him up for a fool you can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher he has not left that open to us he didn't intend to so it's either he's a lunatic and madman and a cult Jim Jones type or he's God there is no in, be in between because that's a lot of lies a lot of lying a lot of lying deep levels of lying this man and this is why I believe that I'm not talking about this man, but I'm talking about um, Jesus completely. But I believe that this man was so important. The man Jesus is so important as it relates to um, our understanding that he wasn't just some regular person. Some regular person. You have to be some type of special somebody for people to die because of what you have said. The martyrs. They have a book called the Book of the Martyrs. It takes a lot for you to be turned upside down like John the Baptist and beheaded because of this man. It takes a lot for like one of the disciples to be disawed in half because of this man. Just because of what he said. Some of us <laughs> won't sacrifice ourselves just to open up the door for somebody to go through. <laughs> 
a like sometimes is too much on Facebook. That's too much effort. So we just say, oh, forget it. But this man had a lot of people spread what he did and who he was around the world, globally, and it's still going strong 2,000 plus years later. You don't just do that just for a regular person. Because there was actually other, quote unquote, people who called themselves Jesus that tried to attempt the same thing. And it's in the scriptures. Bar Jesus is one of them. B-A-R-J-E-S-U-S. Because people be like, there's more than one Jesus in the Bible. It is. The one real one or one fake one. And that bar Jesus was actually going around trying to call himself the Messiah. And I forgot what cult it was, but it, I forgot what scriptures it was in the book of Acts. And so this man, Bar Jesus, was basically saying, you know what, I am the second coming of Jesus Christ. And some people were swept away because of his teachings. And they were convinced by him. And then when they found out that he wasn't the man, the group dispersed and he died. So if it's fake, it won't last. That'll preach right there. I can think I could preach like five messages off of that right there. If it's fake, it won't last. If it's not real, it won't last. It won't last. All right. Well, that's the balance of my time. Are there any questions? Yes, you are allowed to ask the preacher a question. If you have a question about what I spoke about this particular evening, um, please feel free to ask and um, let me know. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Um, yes, sweetheart. Well, I only thought the ending of your sermon, but when I walked in, you were talking about um, Jesus and the Bible and the Bible. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a, a trap. Um, number one, if we are anything like Jesus, Jesus was not arrogant, he was confident. I mean, if you're God, you have the most utmost confidence in the world. But it was so funny how, and I'm getting into my message for this week, and it was just so funny how the creator, when he wrapped himself up in flesh, chose not to come off that way. He said, I'm going to get two donkeys, and I'm going to ride lowly on the donkey, and I want everybody's introduction to me to be from a humble standpoint. Not from an arrogant, well, look at me, I'm God, coming in on the chariot like this. Look at me, I'm here to save everyone. Look at your Messiah, like the movie 300, where it says, look at your Messiah, I mean, I am your Savior. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus did. Um, everybody in this room... Everybody online needs to understand and know that there are no such thing as good people. You do good things based on your standard, but you know, human standard is just like this. I call it the goalpost, and they're always moving. They're always moving. Okay, I'm good because, you know, I didn't steal like any money from my mama this morning. I'm doing good. I'm doing good because, you know, instead of sleeping with five women this week, I only slept with my baby mama one time. Baby mama, quote unquote. Not wife, baby mama. Well, you should give me <laughs> the benefit of the doubt because, you know, I didn't set the whole house on fire. Moving goalposts. But we have to ask ourselves, who created the goalpost? Is it us? Because here's one thing I know about humans. Humans like to grade themselves on a curve. I used to be thankful for the curve. When I was in college, I remember that thing. I don't remember nothing else, but I remember that cotton picking curve. And when it came to that bell curve, <laughs> the teacher gave you a test, and that test was difficult because most of us didn't study, but that, 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 that test was hard. 50% of the class, when they got their results back, maybe two people got Bs, 15 Cs, and everybody else got Fs. And we're all shivering in our boots. And the teacher says, the good news is, I gave you a bell curve. Go ahead and add 20 points to your test. And then everybody who had a B now has an A, everybody who now has a C now has a B, and everybody who has an F now has a C. It brought them up. 
they suck. But because of what the teacher did on their behalf, now they are qualified to go on to the next class. Now that's what Christ did for us. He was the bell curve. But with humans, sometimes we'd like to be the bell curve. This is what you call subjective moral morality or moralism. That's the scourge that's going on right now. Moralism. You don't need to be the Bible to be moral. Moral without the Bible. But I ask you, how did you know right from wrong? Who put that inside of you? Who is the originator of that? Are you an animal? Animals actually do more of what God has told them to do than humans. They're still following the original design, but humans like to come up with creative ways to disobey him. And that crazy. So no, it is arrogant for a human to create their own goalposts. You can never say that somebody is wrong or sinful when they are their own um, standard of morality. You can't be your own standard. Because you're always, as humans, we'll, we'll say, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad of a father. I'm not that bad of a, of, a, um, of a worker at my job. I'm not that bad of a friend. You see what I'm saying? I'm not that bad. I actually do a lot of good things. I give in church. I pay my tithes. <laughs> I, um, you know what? I invited two people to church last week. You know what? I cut my cussing down at least 50% this week. Because you know cussing Christians, they kind of like, you know. Like this one preacher, y'all seen that clip? Did y'all y'all got face? Y'all saw that clip this weekend where the preacher was uh, said the uh, AWS like five or ten times in his sermon. Y'all gonna look for it? I shouldn't even said anything about it. But the funny thing about it is, is that there was people behind him clapping, saying, "Go ahead, preacher. Go ahead, preacher. Go ahead." Because <laughs> Christians don't need to act like they all that. You ain't all that. You all holier than thou. But I ask you, number one, would Jesus say something like that in order to get his point across? I believe people sometimes who use profanity have very little vocabulary. That's just my opinion. My opinion. My opinion. Okay. Um, but that preacher was just cussing up a storm and the people were clapping for him. And when somebody tried to rebuke him, he said, you're just too religious for me. But I ask you, do you see yourself saying something like that before God? If we said something to you face to face, the answer is no. I wouldn't do that. I would be too scared to. I'm scared now. Just to be edgy. Just because somebody said it's in the Bible. But number one, God never called any human an ass. He was referring to a donkey. So you can't say that. <laughs> you can't use that particular word in the context of a human and God didn't speak in KJV when he wrote the scriptures out in the Old Testament it was in Hebrew so you won't even find that word in the Old Testament so why are you saying it because you got a cussing problem as a preacher and you wanted to justify it because everybody said go ahead and, and you Christians are too judgmental you need to sit yourself down somewhere and stay out of my business and this is a preacher saying this. But Jesus said, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. That kind of covers just about everybody in the church. Just about. <laughs> you cross land and sea to win one proselyte or win one person that you have hustled. And now you make that person because of your behavior, because of your lax attitude with the scriptures, you make that person twice the son of hell. So you got people defending sinfulness versus saying, Pastor, I don't really think that that was good. And no, that's not in the scriptures because it wasn't in the Hebrew or the Greek. The word doesn't exist in the Hebrew. You made that up. Okay. So no, um, that was a long explanation of that. But you know, pastors, we always like to say, take one minute. It just took me a long time to explain it. <laughs> Are there any questions? So no, you can't be arrogant. You can't come off as this, that. Yes, ma'am. So what do you, like, how do you communicate with someone who is like that? And who is arrogant? Yeah, they go by their own moral compass. It's like, if you point stuff out, it's kind of like, oh, well, I'm a good person. How do you talk to them? Well, I'll give you an example of what, um, I forgot what his name is. 
the way of the master. Um, I, I forgot what the gentleman's name is, but he was going on the street and he was talking to young people and old people alike. And he asked them, do you think that you're a good person? And the individual was like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm a good guy. <laughs> I'm a good girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, and, you know, kind of like, you know, just, just kind of nonchalant with it. And then he proceeded to probe. And he said, are you sure? And he said, yeah, I think so. And then the, and then the, the person who was interviewing the person says, okay, I'm going to give you a quick little test. First of all, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. You game for that? I have your permission? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, have you ever lied before? Any time in your life? Yes, then you're a liar. Have you ever taken something that was not yours before? Yes, then you're a thief. Have you ever um, done something instead of worshiping or praising God? Have you ever skipped out on church um, in order to do something else? Or put something above anything dealing with God? Yeah, you know, sometimes people get busy, then you're an idolater. Have you ever wanted something that didn't belong to you? Yeah, then you're envious. <laughs> Have you ever, <laughs> and it just kept going going on and on and on. And so according to that particular standard, according to the Ten Commandments, you're not a good person. Because according to God, you have to keep all of those perfectly in mind and in deed. Are you still a good person? And the person was like, well, 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 based on the Ten Commandments, no. But, you know, I believe that I am a good person. And I said, no, you, you're not, because your standard can't get you to heaven. That's it. So when you're talking with somebody who says that they are just a good person, you hold up that Ten Commandments, and you tell them to look at that, and I said, if you have not done these perfectly within the last week, then you're not a good person. And if they say, well, I don't believe in all of that, then you're not saved. You're still a sinner. That's what you say. That's what I would say. That's it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just want to say that. Um, I think all of them, I know, I, you know, the word says, and um, I think it's in Romans where Paul talked about where he says um, the things that he want to do. Mm. find himself practicing things that we shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And all of us do that sometimes. We end up doing things we pray about when we look we right back to see. Mm -hmm. It always ends up Lord right back to square one. But it's in the that's coming just now. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if you meet an arrogant person that feel like they all together and everything is, is good, the Bible tells you don't cast your pearls among swine. But sometimes when you try to explain to them the word of God, they don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. So you need to just stop right there. Mm -hmm. You know, like I use that spin to us, they will say, well, oh, but I know all of that, but I know I am this and that. I would just cut off because the Bible tells you don't do that. Because yeah. it actually happened, and, and that's happened with people, especially Jehovah's Witnesses, when they come to your house, they always like you to grab down what they say, but when you begin to speak to them, they don't want to hear what you're saying. So it's like, you have to cut it off. Because what's going to happen is that you're going to begin arguing back and forth. Yeah. And it doesn't, I, I don't think mm -hmm. you need to argue God where God stands himself. Because mm -hmm. God is there. And if you don't want to hear it, then that's Yeah, and, and I think that it just depends on who your audience is. If somebody is in a dialogue with you, the Bible says, let us reason together. Mm -hmm. Let us reason. Let us reconcile. We have the ministry of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. But if there's somebody that just flat out don't want to hear it, then just as you said, you don't cast your pearls before what my say, one of my old sayings. You don't cast your pearls before swine-minded people. If somebody's going to be absolutely pig-headed, then you just, you know. You have to do Matthew 15, verse 18, which is, if your brother sinned against you, you try to talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work, then in the mouth of two, three witnesses, words established. So you get a couple of their friends that got some sense, and y'all get together to try to discuss it. person still don't want to listen, then you got to take it to the church. Or the elders, that's what the elders represent. And then if they still don't listen, then <laughs> you go from beyond that point and you avoid them like the plague. You just leave them alone. Those, that's, the, that's the reconciliation process. So. Yeah. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Um, all I know is, is that if you really want to be blessed God's way, humble is the way to go. I want to go to heaven on my knees, not on my uh, feet. Not on my knees. I mean, not on my feet, but on my knees. And even when I just think about that, I just think, 
just so deeply like what could you even say if God asked you one word that could get you into heaven what would you say what could you possibly say I'm asking everybody that question what would you say, if you had one word that could get you into heaven what would you say Jamar let's start with you Oh, you done went down the chute. <laughs> um, it's easy. Love? Okay, what about you? Um, There's no right or wrong answer. This doesn't count. <laughs> when you say this is just like nonsense. If you had one word that could get you into heaven, what would it be? If God asked you, give me one word that would get you into heaven. In other words, what's the password to get you? Grace. Huh? Grace. That's okay. <laughs> All right. What would you say? Manny? Oh, mercy. Mercy? That's yours? Yeah. Mercy? Lord, help me, Lord. Help me. I'm an empty pitcher before a full thousand. Uh, I'll probably be crying the whole time. I'll just probably be crying as soon as I got there. I'll be like, oh, this is really real. Oh, Jesus. You'd probably be like, stop crying. What would you say, Al? Thank you. Okay. What would you say, Manny? Okay. What would you say? Oh, the same thing. Lord, I must grace. 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 <laughs> you know what I would say? And of course, I'm the one who asked the question. You know what I would say? The one word that could get me into heaven? Jesus. Mm. You should have said it. Say it. <laughs> Ain't no wrong answer. That's the only thing you yeah. can say ever. Yes, just Jesus. And the reason why all of you all are right is because in Jesus, all of oh, that man. is possible. Y'all about to make me pray. Hold on. Let me pray. Run up the table, I love it. <laughs> All right. So I hope and pray that um, that uh, especially during Holy Week. And so once again, are we still? Okay. So once again, um, um, if you want to give, we have the kiosk in the back. If you, those of you that are watching online. Just go to www.divinetruthcc.org and you can sow a seed into this ministry. We're trying to do some great things in this particular year. So definitely um, make sure that you do that. And then also we have two events that's going on this weekend. The first event is we will be at Secret Lake Park. Okay. At Secret Lake Park, um, which is right across the street. It's, it's Castleberry. We're going to be in conjunction with about mm, one, two, three, four, five, five or six other churches, maybe more, and we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful um, Easter festival. There'll be kids and babies everywhere. Hopefully, I'll get a chance to see some costumes because I like seeing kids in costumes that are shaped like eggs and all this other stuff like that. Um, it's going to be a wonderful time that we'll be giving away Kindle fires and some prizes and other things like that out there. So bring your family out there. It's not going to be a preaching event. It's not going to be a revival. No. It's a way for us to um, show the love of Christ and use words ne if necessary. That's on the 31st from 10 a.m. to 12, 12, 12 p.m. Okay. If I do that often, it's because my brain is packed with stuff. So I need to thank you all for helping me. So make sure that you come out with that. Um, transportation will be provided. I think that we'll be leaving from the church at 9.55 because it takes five minutes to get over there. <laughs> That's the latest. No, we're probably going to leave the church probably about around, I would say, like 9.30 so we can get there on time because this parking is just going to be crazy. And then on Sunday at 10.30 a.m., we will be having our Easter Sunday morning service, just one service, not five services, at least not yet, but just one service at that particular morning. So please bring your family and friends out just to hear the word of the Lord and the gospel. All right. Be blessed, people of God.